What strikes me as well is the Bible being a book of people and each of those people having at least one talent. The other thing that strikes me is that um, for each of them, their talent was only maximized. It only came to life in the context of the relationships they had. So you think about Joseph uh, T. Talk about Joseph. Actually, the, the entire story of Joseph's life was one of relationships. His, uh, was his elder brother who persuaded his brothers not to kill him but just throw him in the water system. He built a relationship with the, the, uh, the baker and the uh, cupbearer. And uh, later on, the cupbearer mentioned him to the king. And he made friends with the king, built that relationship of trust. He became the prime minister. Um, so throughout his life, actually, his, his talent, his gift, only made sense in the context of the relationships he built. Um, what about Paul? Uh, I mean, Paul, um, Paul was only where he was because, because of people who encouraged him. Barnabas was his encourager. Um, and, and in turn, he then modeled that and encouraged Timothy. And uh, and the most well, we have much of the New Testament to thank Paul for, and each of those letters is about his relationship with a community of people, a church in a particular location. So I hope you can see, uh, and, and Daniel as well. I mean, Daniel befriended the civil servant and persuaded him, um, instead of uh, eating the fine food and the fine wine, that he might allow them to have a diet of vegetables and water and and he built that relationship of trust and, uh, and later Daniel was seen to be the wisest more than all the sorcerers and magicians and uh, he had a relationship with the king and so the king was saddened when he uh, was tricked into putting Daniel into the lion's den and you know, it, it's a story of relationships the talent the gift, the strength only comes to life in the context of relationships. And for me, as I look at the Bible, the Bible is not a book of rules. Many Christians do see the Bible as a book of rules. Uh, a book of rules about how to live, what to do and not what to do. For me, the Bible is not a book of rules. The Bible is a book of relationships. It's the history of God's relationship with people down through history or through a particular period of history. And it's no wonder because in God we see, um, <clears throat> we see relationships modeled. Uh, uh, as Christians, we celebrate the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which to some people seems completely illogical. How can there be one God but three of them? Um, and, and some people have a lot of problems with that theology. But for me, I, I'm not a mathematician, but I can, I can do some basic maths. Uh, and my basic maths uh, helps me understand that the Trinity is actually uh, absolutely logical and rational. Because one plus one plus one does equal three, but one multiplied by one multiplied by one does equal one. It's completely logical and rational. And so we celebrate the fact that God, Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, live in this dynamic family. This, some people describe it as a dance. They live in this dynamic tension this dynamic community where there's mutual love and affirmation and preferment and sacrifice and service from one to the other to the other. And because we've been created in the image of a God like that, it means that we are created for love, appreciation, celebration, sacrifice, service, mutual dependency. 
we are created in the image of our God. We are, we are born for relationship. Because for, our, for any human, regardless of what they believe, uh, to, to, to deny that, is to, deny, to deny that life is about relationships, is a denial of what it means to be human. Because to be human means being in relationship with other people. No man is an island. It's relationships that make the world go round. And that is very simply because we've been created in the image of a God who is community and who is relationship one with another. So <clears throat> this evening as I approach the subject of talent and uh, turning your talent into a strength, um, and, and Paul writes, doesn't he, to Timothy, he says... Uh, fan into flame the gift that God has given you. Fan into flame. And I kind of feel if there was a Bible verse that I, I suspect Pastor Tundi was reading as he uh, discerned the subject for this evening, I think that was probably it. Because this evening is an encouragement for you to fan into flame the gift that God has given you. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6. <clears throat> and what I want to do <clears throat> is to take some time with you this evening and I'm going to get you to do some work with me so uh, you won't be able to kind of uh, stargaze or drift off or start Facebooking because at any moment I might turn to you with a microphone and ask you something. So you're going to need to stay uh, in tip-top uh, alertness for this evening. Welcome, sir, by the way. What's your name? Chi. Chi. Chi D. Chi D. You can do a little name thing. That's great. Thank you. You're very welcome. <clears throat> so this evening, I want to actually talk to you in the context of talent. I want to talk to you about relational leadership. Relational leadership. And for me, there are four uh, features of relational leadership. I believe that if this evening I can help you be a better leader, you will, it will create a context for your gift and talent to flourish. It will provide a context for your gift and talent to be fanned into flame to be stirred up, to be maximized, to be leveraged. And so by the end of this evening, I would like you to have a greater understanding about what relational leadership is. I want you to have some practical tools and techniques that you can take away in practicing what I call relational leadership. And you're going to face up to some things within yourself that might sometimes hold you back from leading. Okay? So that's where we're going. That's what we're going to do. Any questions before I, I, move, I move on? Okay. Great. <coughs> The first feature uh, of relational leadership that I'm going to talk about as the context for talent is what I call authenticity. Authenticity. Three years ago, I first created relationology. Relationology, a new social science about the art of relationships and how relationships impact, life happiness, social impact, and vocational success. But why did I do it? Well, it's simple. <clears throat> Three years ago, a friend of mine asked me to speak at their business conference on the subject of networking. Now, you may be like me. When I heard that word, when he said, Matt, will you come speak on networking, something happened inside me. And it's what British people call cringing. I cringed inside. I kind of 
oh, I came, I became tense and screwed up inside with distaste. Because if you're like me, you've probably had some bad experiences of being networked and trying to network because you're told it's the right thing to do. And uh, my experiences of networking are that sometimes it can be manipulative, it can be contrived, it can be short-term, shallow, superficial, uh, self-serving. And, uh, and so all these things go through my mind. And whenever I talk to an audience of people, uh, and I say the word, the N word, I have some empathy with, with some of the things they might be thinking. So I said to my friend, I can't stand networking. And I explained to him why. I said, I just love building long-term, mutually beneficial relationships. And he looked at me. He said, Matt, he said, will you come and speak at our conference on that subject? I said, yes, I'll be delighted. And it was then that I created Relationology, because I needed to give a new name to building long-term, mutually beneficial relationships that wasn't networking. Because most people, when they hear the N-word, cringe inside. <clears throat> uh, I, was, uh, I was going to a conference uh, at a hotel on Park Lane in Mayfair, as you know. Uh, Park Lane Mayfair hotels are the best in London. And uh, I arrived. Um, I, I registered. I got my name, my name tag and my conference pack. And uh, like most people do when you're thinking about, oh, I'm going to be in a, a long session now, I'm just going to go to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom, and I do what gentlemen do in the bathroom. And as I stood reading what was on the wall, nothing very interesting really, somebody else came and stood beside me at the facility next to mine. And um, they began to talk to me. And uh, they said, oh, I wish this conference hadn't started quite so early. Um, I'm not sure if I should have bothered coming to the conference because uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be any good. And the program doesn't look that exciting. They went on and on and on, and I just stood there and I finished my business and I went and I just kind of nodded. I didn't say very much. And 30 minutes later, in the main ballroom with uh, thousands of people and uh, dozens and dozens of banqueting tables where the guests all sat, the keynote speaker was introduced. And as I walked up to the podium, and looked out upon the crowd, the only person I could see was the man who stood next to me at the urinals in the bathroom. I want to say to you, you never know who you're talking to. Appearances can be deceptive. I was, um, I was, um, um, can't say too much because Pastor Tundi will guess the context. But I was, um, I was in a very large um, church, and uh, I was in the pastor's office. And, uh, you know, I love these pastors. They have nice sofas and nice armchairs, and I was relaxing in one of these. And uh, these couple of guys came in, and I started to make conversation with them. And uh, from the first moment, I could tell they weren't really interested. And after a few minutes of kind of asking them a question and them kind of giving me an answer, but clearly not wanting... Has that ever happened to you? Clearly not wanting to make conversation. Um, I kind of gave up and I talked to somebody else in the office. And then five minutes later, the senior gentleman of the two came up to me and he said, Mr. Bird, I'm so sorry. I didn't know who you were. If it matters who I am or who you are, there's something wrong, isn't there? 
I have a friend, um, and she is involved in a business, uh, senior level in a business, and uh, she often interviews uh, new candidates for senior roles in the firm. And uh, she tells me the stories of uh, some of the candidates she interviews. And uh, she has this little approach to her interviews. Uh, and she'll give them a, you know, have a great interview with them, and the candidate performs and answers the questions, and you know, puts on their best impression and draws their best experiences and the best evidence to show that they're the best candidate. But once the candidate's left the interview room, she gives them a few minutes, and then she goes out to the reception area. And uh, when the candidate's left the building, she'll ask the receptionist, how did the candidate treat you on the way into and on the way out of the interview? Because how we treat people that we think can't help us says more about us than how we treat the people we think can help us. Because anybody can smile and be polite and courteous and respectful in an interview when they're after something. But how do we treat the people who seemingly can do nothing for us? You see, I would like to say that authenticity is not something you can switch on and you switch off. If authenticity is something you switch on and you can switch off, it's not authenticity. It's what you call duplicity or hypocrisy. Because authenticity treats, means that you treat everyone you meet as if they're a prospective client. You treat everyone you meet as if they're a VIP. You treat everyone you meet with great respect and dignity. And that we develop a lifestyle and a DNA of authenticity. So it's one thing smiling at the senior pastor and being polite and smiling and being polite to your boss at work and smiling to the, the member of parliament when you meet them and anybody can do that. But it's how you treat the bus driver and the taxi driver, the receptionist, the waiter, the waitress. It's how we treat the people who we think it's not true, actually, but we think in our minds can do nothing for us. This is what it means to be authentic as a leader, to treat all people with dignity and respect. Imagine, imagine if Joseph in prison had thought, well, I may be in prison, but I was falsely accused. These other so-and-sos in here, they're in here because they broke the law. I'm better than they are, and I'm going to keep out of their way. What would have happened? The key feature of relational leadership is authenticity. Because in the fertile ground of authenticity, your gift and your talent can grow and flourish. So I want, to ask, I want to ask you a question. In fact, I'm going to just ask you to turn to the person next to you. So Kane, Yemi, Bo and Gloria, Chidi and Vine, Tommy and Chris, you guys. And I'll go with Pastor Tundi. Um, I want you to have a conversation for a few minutes. And I want, to ask, I want you to ask each other the question, in what way could you be more authentic? In what way? I'm not asking you to come up with ten ways or two ways. I'm asking each of you to come up with one thing that you could do to become more authentic in the way that you treat other people. Okay, you have got three or four minutes. Off you go. 
and I will be asking for feedback. Um, we talked about um, showing genuine interest um, in whoever we meet. Um, Sister Tommy talked about smiling as well. And uh, sometimes we'll force, because of people's uh, dispositions to us, we'll force to become snobby. So if you are an open person and you're like, hello, how are you doing? And uh, the person acts snobbish, you just, it's just like cold water poured on you. Yeah. And you tend to just freeze and show the same kind of disposition back to that person but um i think what we just talked about was basically looking beyond whatever or whoever you're talking to and actually showing genuine interest 
irrespective of the response you get. Very good. That, that's what Jesus would do anyway. Thank you, Chris. Brilliant. Okay. Chidi. Uh, well, the, the example that I gave was uh, similar to what Chris was saying, and that's uh, trying to overcome the tendency of acting on the preconceptions perhaps I've created or that exist of people who I deal with. So I took the work situation. Mm. So for instance, someone could have a reputation of being nasty to to people. So going, not going with that at the back of your mind and expecting a nasty reaction and thereby, you know, already being on the defensive and, you know, even innocent comments are treated as if they are attacks. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chidi. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else want to go? Thank you, T. Um, for me, it's about showing genuine interest in people. Okay. You, you can't say that because they said that. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, f uh, you know, and then uh, going the extra mile as well. Um, <coughs> I was telling her that, you know, if you enter into a bus, you're in a bus and somebody just comes and sits next to you and just start talking to you, what do you do? Do you ignore them? Do you grow cold? I said, for me, once you sit next to me and you start chatting with me, whatever your age is, I just start chatting with you. All and I have to you'll do... You'll never get away. No, I just <laughs> chat with them. Thank you. Bo? Because I crossed my hands. <laughs> right. Um... For me, I, I, I believe what I said was, how would I like someone to treat me? But it doesn't work for everybody the same. Um, what I mean is, um, how would I want a leader to treat me? How would I like to be spoken to? And it's about giving back the same respect I would expect to get, or I would like to get. Um, but like I said, it, it doesn't work for everybody that way. And for me, the essential thing is basically walk, walking in love. That, that, if, if you walk in love, you might show someone um, interest. But if you're not doing it in love, yeah, I could talk with you. Um, I, could listen to, I could pretend to listen to what you say. I could, you know, we may say genuine interest. But I believe if it's, if it's stirred on with love, um, what do you mean by love? Now I'm speaking about the, the, the love in First Corinthians chapter Don't 13. quote the Bible at me. <laughs> what do you mean by love? Um, the love of God. Um, I'm, what, tell uh, me about the love si of God. Sincere love. From sincere love. Sincere love. The love of God that's been shed abroad in our hearts. Uh, because, to be honest, we, we, we could speak about the um, love in the context of the world and everybody's speaking about love. But there is a different sort of love in the heart of a Christian. Um, you may call it sacrificial love because it mentions love is kind, it's, it, it's, it's, it's gentle, mm. it does not judge, it does not um, think, yeah, it does not take offense, it does not, you know, we talked about preconceived notions. It's all about that. Yeah. And if you can walk, if you, if you can walk in, that, in that love, mm. all the things we've mentioned come easily. Mm. It, I'm not saying the walk of love is easy, mm. but we can do it because mm. we have got the Spirit of God in us. We mm. just need to release ourselves to it. Fantastic. Thank you, Bo. You keep hold of the microphone for the moment. That'd be great. So the first feature for me of relational leadership is authenticity. The second feature of relational leadership is intentionality intentionality did you know that 95 percent of people are imitators and only five percent of people are initiators so if you put a hundred business cards in your pocket and over the next few days you uh, give out those business cards how many of the people you give those business cards to 
are going to con contact you in return. Any idea? Less than five. Less than five percent. Try it sometime. I do it all the time. All the time. The reason being is that 95% of people are imitators and only 5% of people are initiators. Most people are reactive. A minority of people are proactive. Uh, let's do a little vote. Who, who loves Twitter? Nobody. Who, what well, one? Who loves Facebook? Okay. And are the rest of you? Okay. So you're on LinkedIn? No. Uh, let's, let's, try, let's try again. Forget, forget all that. How many of you use social media? So what do you use, Chidi? You do use Facebook. Okay, great. Okay. What about you, Yemi? Use Facebook. Facebook. Okay. <coughs> so, here we go. A little experiment. Relationology has a Facebook page. And it's very simple to remember. Facebook.com oblique relationology. Okay. And on there, I give loads of stuff away. Now five, sorry? Yeah, www.facebook.com oblique relationology. Relationology. Now, um, little experiment. Only 5% of you will do something with that information. True. Some of you have written it down. Some of you haven't written it down. It won't be whether you've written it down or not that makes the difference. Only 5% of you will do something with that information. I want to say to you, okay. Okay, okay. It could be a factor. It could be a factor. Um, I'll, I'll give you something on Facebook. Uh, sorry, I'm on, I'll give you a website thing in a moment. Is that right? But uh, <laughs> you're not talking about the medium. You're saying that might. I'm saying that. Um, uh, but I could do another experiment. I could give you all a business card tonight. How many of you would email me in return? Well, that would depend on whether I need your service or not, eventually, still. Okay. <laughs> okay. I would argue, Kay, <laughs> that actually it doesn't come down to need. It comes down to the fact, are you intentional or not intentional? Because we're talking about relational leadership. People who are relationally leading will connect and reconnect with people. I'll put some flesh on the bones in a moment for you. Um, but I want to say to you that you can choose to differentiate yourself from 95% of people by choosing to be intentional. And I'm not just talking about being online or business cards, but in any other way. You can differentiate yourself today from 95% of people by choosing to be intentional and choosing to be deliberate. I encourage people in my relationology programs to be intentional in three ways. To collect relationships, to keep relationships, and to grow relationships. To collect, keep, grow, collect relationships. I encourage people to set a target. 
you know, this week, how many new people do you want to meet? I encourage people to write a wish list, not of what they want for Christmas or their birthday, but of the people they'd one day like to meet. There was a young man in one of my master classes, and we talked about writing a wish list. He sat there, there and then, and he wrote a wish list of people he'd one day like to meet. And, uh, and I challenged him the next time he had the opportunity, I challenged the, the, the class, to actually reach out and try and meet that person. He phoned me 10 days later. He said, Matt, you're not going to believe what's happened. I said, try me. He said, the name that I wrote at the top of my list was a guy called Seth Godden. I don't know if you know Seth Godden. International marketing guru. World famous. Blogs. Incredible. Written dozens of books. He was the guy at the top of my list. He said, uh, a few days later, an email came into my inbox and it mentioned a competition to go and spend a day in New York with Seth Godin. He said, my immediate thought was, oh, there's no point in entering the competition because thousands of other people will and I'll never win it. And then he heard me say to him, but give it a go. He gave it a go. And he was phoning me in that moment because he said, I've just had a phone call from New York because I entered the competition and I've won. And I'm going to New York to spend a day with Seth Godin. So I'd like to encourage you to set a target about the number of people you want to meet. But I'd like to encourage you to write a wish list specifically naming people you would one day like to meet. And be intentional and deliberate about collecting relationships. Because guess what? 95% of people are not intentional about collecting relationships. They'll meet you once. They might have your Twitter, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your email, your phone number, your mobile number. But you will never, ever hear from them again. Um, again. But you could choose to be intentional and deliberate. Keep in relationships. I have a little thing where I say, actually, if I've met somebody and I want to keep in contact with them, I will reach out to them again within 24 to 48 hours. So if I've met somebody once, I will either phone them, write to them, text them, email them within 24 to 48 hours to affirm the fact that we met and to cement in their minds my name and the conversation we had with each other. Because most people will not take all the business cards they have and put them on their database. But actually, if you send them an email afterwards, you'll at least be in their inbox and they can find you again if they want to. Relationships are a contact sport. And that's how we keep relationships alive. So firstly, being deliberate about collecting relationships. Secondly, being deliberate about keeping relationships. Thirdly, being deliberate about growing relationships. Sometimes it's just a matter of doing something together. It doesn't matter how big or how small that thing is. To grow a relationship to the next level, to do something together. There was a guy that I wrote on my wish list and uh, many years ago, he'd been on my wish list for approaching nine years. And an opportunity came my way to take a guest to a private lunch with 18 other people and David Cameron. And uh, I thought, this is an irresistible opportunity. So I wrote to this guy out of the blue, asked him to be my guest. He didn't know me from Adam. And uh, he accepted. He said, come to my office, my chauffeur will take us. And uh, we had a great lunch. Afterwards, I reached out to him and said, let's have coffee. We had coffee. Realized we both liked food and, uh, and, and fine dining. And uh, I said, I tell you what, why don't you bring a friend and I'll bring a friend. And I'll, and I'll take us to this amazing...